Zatan Kalis from TLDR News, and today I'm joined by Matt Clifford. I think you're, you're a man with many hats. You're sort of chair mm -hmm. of ARIA, and you're currently the PM's representative of the AI Summit. Yeah. Um, I've got a question about ARIA later, but if we start the AI Summit, so what is, what is the aim of the AI Summit? What would be like the ideal outcome? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. You know, you're right. I mean, this is, this is a, a weird, for me, sort of a little foray into, into diplomacy. I, yeah. As you said, my, my, my normal job is I run an investment company called Entrepreneur First. But I, I, I came into to government to do this because, you know, I believe that AI is the most important technology uh, of our lifetimes. And I think the reason it's so important is that if we get it right, it will unlock the most extraordinary benefits. You know, it will make us wealthier and healthier. It's one of the things that can address many of the biggest challenges that we face in the world. But, and it's quite a big but, there are lots of ways that we might worry about how the future of AI goes. And that what the AI Safety Summit is all about is saying the only way we're going to capture all that upside and those benefits is if AI is safe and if the public trust that, believes that it's safe. And so what this is all about is getting together the key people, the people building AI, governments, but also the people affected by AI and saying, what do we do together to make sure we get to that good outcome? Yeah, and I think it is, it is really quite notable that you have got all of the big players at the table. I mean, it's not just that you've got sort of like both China and the US and obviously all of these various tech companies, but it's also just amazing that you've convinced politicians to care about like a big existential risk in the past, advocates have really struggled to get politicians to pay much attention to what, you know, existential risk, stuff like nuclear, stuff like biosafety. So why do you think politicians have paid this much attention to AI? Well, I guess the first thing I'd say is like, we, we're here to talk about all the, all the what we're calling the frontier risks of AI, which, you know, maybe goes right up to existential risk, but it's certainly not the only thing. And, and, you know, I think this is one of the things that's been amazing about the, the sort of last two days is realizing actually that although this can seem like a very polarized debate if you follow it just through you know sort of twitter uh actually there's a lot of common ground and where the common ground is is in saying we're building powerful systems that we don't fully understand we want to benefit from those systems so what can we agree on that we need to do in terms of things like testing evaluation um, safety research that allows us to get to that better future. And I do think you're right that actually it's not very helpful in general when you're talking to politicians or to the public to sort of go straight for the most extreme scenarios. Even if you think that those are a possibility, it's best to say, what is the path that we're on right now and how do we help make it a better path? And I think that balance of the optimism that AI could be an extraordinary force for good, but we have to get it right, is the sort of message that's landed with, with politicians around the world. Okay, yeah. And so you just mentioned there, you're, of course, there are, there's a continuum of risks, aren't yeah. there? So you've got like the, the existential risk at the end of the spectrum, the sort of like Terminator style, non-aligned AGI thing. But then way before that, you've got anxieties about disinformation, yeah. about fraud, about how it affects like politics. Yeah. What is the focus of the summit at the moment? Is it sort of all of those risks? Yeah, so, so the Prime Minister gave a speech last week um, about the risks, and he also at the same time published, for the, I think the first time ever any government in the world, a, uh, a report on the UK government's view of the risks, which was based on a range of sources, including, including intelligence assessments, that basically says, you know, what are some of the things that we should worry about? And, you know, I, I guess what I would say is that you know, personally, I'm not too worried about the Terminator scenario. Um, what I worry about is more misuse um, and, and sort of a sort of broader set of issues of control that sort of are not, you know, I, I don't think it's helpful to say, you know, one day the machine's going to wake up and decide to kill us. That's not the risk. The risk is that we give over more and more uh, control of key societal and economic processes to systems that we don't fully understand and that you know, either quickly or slowly, the sort of outcomes uh, of, of those processes become misaligned with and out of line with, with what we want yeah. as humans. But, you know, if, if I go to the, you know, one, one of the things I've really wanted to emphasize throughout the process is that this whole sort of long-term versus short-term risk, it's a false dichotomy. In fact, what we're talking about when we talk about things like bio-risk or cyber-risk yeah. are things that could happen next year. You know, right now we already have powerful AI systems. I mean, if you've used GPT-4, yeah. it's pretty amazing. But what we know is that next year, the same companies that have brought us the systems we have today will release models that might have had up to 100 times more investment 
than the ones yeah. that we have today. So again, I'm not in any way saying, to be very clear, that next year's models are gonna be Terminator. In fact, they're definitely not. But what I am saying is, those models, if not safeguarded properly, could put into the hands of bad actors very powerful capabilities that none of us have an interest yeah. in them having. Yeah, you've obviously just brilliantly articulated like the sort of the range of risks there. Um, one of the things I think that is, is quite sort of, um, which makes AI sort of unprecedented, is that it's like a strategically significant technology that's dominated by the private sector. And I'm sure you know because of your work with ARIA and all that sort of thing, that that's, that's a reversal of the historic trend and that normally strategically significant technologies have been dominated by the public sector. Do you think that's a risk? Are we worried about that? Does that increase the risk? And are you optimistic about like public-private cooperation? No, so, <laughs> your line there is a line I have used myself very many times. It is very historically unusual. And I think that calls for, um, for, for, for action, basically. And I hope that one of the things that you'll see coming out of the summit is a broad commitment, not just from the UK, and, and the US who have already announced AI safety institutes, but from, from other countries that actually we need to build public sector capability in this space. Now what I would say is that's not, I think, about trying to build, you know, Brit GPT and having our own, you know, lang large language models. But I do think it's about being able to say, is there a group within government that can actually evaluate these models for risk? And, you know, at the moment, Actually, I think the companies have acted responsibly in how they evaluate models. But it's quite right that people will say, well, they shouldn't be able to mark their own homework. And actually, as we get to more and more powerful systems, I think you are going to want there to be uh, government-backed bodies that have the technical capability to do that. And that's a really hard thing to do because, you know, as well as everything else, the people, you know, AI scientists are some of the most in-demand and therefore highly paid people in the world. I think one of the things that I've been most excited to see over the last six months is the you know, UK Frontier AI Task Force not only get set up and you know, be back with significant investment, but actually being able to attract world-class AI talent from around the world, you know, including hiring people from OpenAI, from Oxford, from Cambridge, all these places. And so that's going to be really important. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times as well uh, the, the sort of like the, the PR issue that AI has, at least in some parts of the public, you know, the, you see that reflected in slightly knee-jerk policies against AI, you know, in Italy there was a sort of like provisional ban, and you've got the pause AI campaign, which has been picking up a bit of steam recently. How, do you think the public sector needs to do more to sort of educate and make people more optimistic about the possible benefits of AI, not just the risks? And are you like optimistic that AI can solve its PR problem? I mean, I'm fundamentally extremely optimistic about AI. Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't be doing this. Um, I, I think, you know, I think what we need to do, and I think we start to do that in the, in the lead up to and at this summit, is just tell a balanced story. And I think sometimes it's easy for this to become very polarized. And so people want to sort of only make one side of the case. I don't think that's helpful. I think the public's smart and it, it, the p people, um, people get that, that that can't be the whole story. You know, the way I, you know, I, I am an entrepreneur. Like my entire life, that's, well, my entire career, that's what I've done. And, you know, as an entrepreneur and as an investor in entrepreneurs, the way I think about it is the only AI that will actually be adopted. The only AI that people will actually pay for is safe AI. People aren't gonna pay for AI that behaves in unexpected ways or does things they don't want it to do. And as a result, it's in all our interest to care about safety if we care about adoption. And so, you know, I think the way that you solve the AI PR problem is build real use cases that are actually useful to people and show them that it does what they expect it to do. And, you know, the reality is, and this is one of the points we've been trying to make throughout the prep for the summit, is most startups building AI today are working what I would call narrow AI systems. You know, they're not building enormous general purpose models that need to be trained on thousands or tens of thousands of, of GPUs. They're building things for specific, you know, narrow, um, you know, narrow uh, use cases. And that, I think, is how AI solves its PR problem. Yeah, well, thank you very much for all of that. And it's, it's great to see someone so optimistic about AI, especially when you can get a bit of doom-mongering around there. But thank you very much, Matt. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah.